I suppose I'm constitutionally drawn to aspects of the Great War which I feel that historians have either ignored or, 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 or just ne simply never researched. And um, it's fair to say there's never been a book, uh, or there's not been a book for 80 years on the animals of the Great War, and there's never ever been a book about wildlife and nature on the, on the Western Front. So when I discovered that, I thought, well, this is a fantastic opportunity to write a book that will fill you know, a small but, but significant gap in the, in the Great War's history. Well, there are over 60 species of animal um, uh, and insect, should I say, in, in the book. Um, but certain, for example, birds, there are, there are over 40 varieties of birds as well. So um, in total, there are probably 100, 100 plus different, uh, different animals in, and different insects in the, in the book. Um, I mean, they vary from everything from the smallest worm and the spiders right up to, to lions and emus. Um, lions, I mean, it sounds ridiculous, but if you think about it, in the First World War, uh, zoos and private collections of exotic animals were overtaken by the war, and these animals were either, either starved or left to starve in their cages, or they were released into the countryside. And some of those animals found their way into the trenches, usually as mascots. So you get examples of, of a lion cub um, being the, the property of a, of a fairly senior British officer. And he used to take that into the trenches and it would pad down the front line with him. Um, and the Germans had those lion cubs too. I've seen pictures of those. So you've got those sort of stories right down, as I say, to, to things like worms. You know, you've got an amazing story of, of a man sitting there in a sort of Robert the Bruce moment where a bombardment is taking place and this spider is falling from the dugout's roof and it's crawling back up again and he's just watching this. And of course for him it takes his mind off, off you know, potential death which is just above his head. But at the same time he's watching the struggle of this spider trying to, to get back to the roof and each percussion it falls back down again. So there's, there's just everything and you know, just so many varieties. It's, it's, it's a wonderful story. There are two types of research. There's the archive research, so that meant going to places like the Imperial War Museum in London and the Peter Little Archive in, in Leeds, where you can look at thousands of documents there and, and you can do searches for particular words of animals, say, you know, dogs, cats, pigeons. Um, but essentially, it was just an enormous amount of speed reading. I got um, dozens of scores and scores of memoirs from the First World War, most of them out of print for, say, 70, 80 years and I just read them one after the other, looking for those gems. Uh, now, that took an enormous amount of time, but it was very rewarding because um, most soldiers, you think about it, two million men on the Western Front, they're sat there, most of them in the countryside, what do they write about? Well, if they don't want to write about the, the horror and, what the, the, and the dead, they often wrote about the nature. Um, and the wildlife around them. So that, that, that was not only, you know, that doesn't, it not only appears in their letters, but also in the, in the, in the memoirs they later published. I think the stories uh, that appealed to me mostly were those that said something about the human condition. Um, so for example, I love the stories where men would idly watch birds flying west and they would sort of think, wow, you know, those birds, they could be sat on my house, uh, on the roof of my house, on the gate of my, uh, at the end of my drive. You know, my family might be seeing those birds in, in two or three hours' time. So they had these sort of, literally, these flights of fancy. And they're very moving at times. On one level, you've got how, um, how the war altered nature as a whole, so na how nature adapted to the Western Front. So you've got the battlefields of 1914 and 1915, which look pretty much like they did before the First World War started. And then you've got the kind of morasses that you think of later in the, in the Battle of the Somme and Passchendaele. And animals adapted to that environment. And so that's, that's one aspect. I mean, you think, I think particularly of, of birds that are you know, normally shy of human beings that would nest in dugouts and live cheek by jowl with the officers there. And the officers themselves would, would protect those birds. So they would say no one could fire a rifle anywhere near the, the nesting birds. And so there's that sort of aspect. And then you've got the micro aspect, which is absolutely fascinating, where you can get little insights or little vignettes into the lives of these soldiers. For example, one officer, he's, he's in a trench. Um, Lieutenant Filders, his name is, and it's a cold, damp night, and he's standing there, and he sort of goes like that on the back of his neck, and he can feel something crawling there, and he goes, oh, God, I, I, I hate creepy crawlies. Oh, what's that now? Especially the ones I can't see. And then he just stands there, and he's looking, and he's looking at his dugout, and it's pouring with rain, and he thinks, well, at least the rain will suppress the spiders in my dugout. And that's something I'd never thought about. 25 years of obsession in the First World War. I've never thought about men having fears or, 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 or you know, terrors of insects, and, but, but so many people do. It's only natural that they would. So there are things like that that are brought out in this story that are completely new to the, to the history of the Western Front.